Hello everyone, once again this is G, and I thought today would be a good day to talk about sour gas boilers. I mean, what kind of a mega base is it anyway if there is no sour gas boiler, right? This particular one was built pretty early on in the game, and I didn't use any space materials to build this. And some of you may have spotted this and are asking what the heck, but this was actually added later on in the game. Like if you look here, for instance, this was constructed about 3,500 cycles ago, a long time ago. And it was running ever since. And this was added about 600 cycles ago. And the reason for that is I needed to get the sulfur for something. I'll talk about that in a minute. But it was pretty, actually, pretty tricky to add this in. I had to tile this in and then just drip a very small amount of super coolant in here. And then it kind of spilled over. It created this little bead. Then I had to mop it up. And then this created a little liquid lock, prevented the sour gas from leaking out into this vacuum chamber. That's what this is for, just a little liquid lock. And it also helps to cool this auto sweeper. And then I put this auto sweeper in here. And that's how I was able to get out the sulfur. But anyway, that's a story for a little bit later. First, I want to talk about the sour gas boiler. Once again, we have no space materials. So the way we heat this is not with an aqua tuner, but instead we just use magma. And it all starts with this. We have a magma pipe over here. And I made a separate video on how to pipe magma, but it's coming out at about 1,700 degrees, and it's coming all the way from down here. Okay, so we have a volcano over here. We have a magma pipe uh, and a magma pump, I'm sorry. Then we have this whole storage of magma over here, and it just kind of loops through this. It's about 1,700 degrees. Some of this magma is used for this uh, petroleum boiler over here. That's another story. But, oh yeah, check this out. So the excess magma is getting pulled into this volcano down here. And yeah, you just need to look at the mass here to, uh, yeah. Anyway, enough about that. That's a different story. So this magma, it comes in through here. I just built a essentially a vacuum chamber down here to help insulate this. And it's using ceramic pipes. There's a lot of ceramic in use here. And along with that, we have an oil pipe, okay, that's coming in from this oil biome. And also there's petroleum mixed in there. It really doesn't matter if you have oil or petroleum, okay? It works the same way for the sour gas boiler in this case. So originally it was only oil, then a little bit of petroleum got mixed in here. It doesn't matter. So this oil and magma, two pipes, they both come up to this. And then this is where it all starts. We have, first of all, we got a couple valves, valve, for the oil is set to one kilo per second. This prevents the pipes from uh, bursting from from state change. No state change occurs in the pipe at one kilo. And then we have another valve over here, and this is for the magma. And again, it's at one kilo, and it's set that way for the same reason, no state change. And these are controlled by a couple of shutoffs. We have a shutoff over here. This is for the oil, and it's activated by these sensors over here. There's an end gate, you can see here. And there's another end gate and a couple sensors for the magma. So for the oil, we want to make sure that the amount of oil in this chamber is below 10 kilos. And this is basically to make sure that there's no pooling of oil. We want to make sure that if it's getting a little bit too oily in here, just to stop the whole feeding process. And we want to make sure that the temperature is at least 540 degrees before we feed any oil into this. So if those two things are met, then it feeds the oil. As for the magma, it wants to make sure that the temperature is not too high, so it needs to be below 550, and it needs to be at least 10 degrees. Why at least 10 degrees is initially this starts off as a vacuum, and the temperature is negative 272. So then you have this magma pooling, or not pooling, but looping through here, and it just creates too many problems. So you wanna make sure you put this sensor in here. So if there's vacuum, it will not let the magma go through. It first waits for the oil to come in. It checks, it sees the temperature of the oil. Then it starts feeding the magma. And the magma, basically, the way it flows is there's a very simple pipe over here made of tungsten, not a radiant pipe. And the reason it's not a radiant pipe is we don't want to release too much heat. I didn't spend too much time playing around with this, trying to figure out which kind of pipe to use. I just went with tungsten, and that seemed to work. And I went with one kilo per second. You could probably do a radiant pipe with less um, magma per second, but this ended up working for me. However, what ends up happening next is as magma goes through here, it's, it's still going to be too hot. It's going to be about 500 degrees and you need to cool it further. So it's followed by these two steam turbines 
and then it's fed out of this pipe over here. And then what happens next is the igneous rock just kind of sits here and then maybe eventually it's going to get picked up by some dupes. But there's also a layer of water that kind of pulls here coming out of this vent. And this water is actually, it comes out of multiple sources and they kind of merge and then they come out of this pipe. Like this pipe down here is going to the uh, oil wells. There's a pipe over here coming from some pumps. This pipe over here is coming from uh, cool steam vents. This pipe over here is coming from, uh, from the uh, natural gas generators because natural gas generators here are sitting in a steam uh, steam box and we have a steam turbine up here and it only activates if the pressure inside builds up to above 20 kilos so that's where all the water comes from but anyway that cools the remainder and it kind of drips down so once we heat up this oil over here flashes to sour gas and then it starts going up and then it comes against this counter flow of oil so we see here we have a copper radiant pipe and we have a counter flow going on here. So we start with sour gas at about 560 and then it very gradually is cooling, it's cooling and it gets to about 200 degrees. Whereas the oil starts at about 110 and then it starts to heat up. And by the time it drips, it's already at a flash point. So at the moment it drips out, it flashes. So we have a nice counter flow here, but then we wanna continue cooling the sour gas. So what we do is we have a counter flow of methane coming in here and this cold methane, it begins at minus negative 170-ish, and then it starts to warm up, and it comes out at about 170 degrees out, and then it gets dripped into here where it gets picked up as natural gas. Because the moment it comes out of this pipe, it's gonna turn into uh, natural gas. And it's going here at one kilo per second, so you're not going to have any burst pipes either. So by the time the sour gas gets all the way to the top, it's at about negative 105, and then it keeps going a little bit further, it hits these temp shift plates made of diamond, which are being cooled by liquid oxygen, because nothing else is available without space materials, so liquid oxygen it is. It hits this, turns to liquid, it, and then immediately is held back by these airflow tiles. This prevents uh, the liquid from falling down into the chamber and turning into natural gas and creating a mess of different gases. So we only have sour gas below, this liquid lock essentially closes up, prevents any more sour gas from going up. This cools the remainder of this, lets it pump out. If there is any natural gas that forms here, sour gas, it's immediately liquefied. Only once this is pumped out, then more sour gas is fed up. So this is kind of a dynamic liquid lock of sorts. And then the sulfur just pulls up here. And this is where I just let it collect here. And then later on I thought, okay, we're going to need some of the sulfur. So I kind of maneuvered a little bit of super coolant in here, but it's not really part of the sour gas itself. It's not part of the sour gas boiler. As far as these insulated tiles are concerned, they're all made of ceramic. You can see here. In fact, let me turn on the uh, overlay. Okay, so we got pipes made out of ceramic that are insulated. We have insulated tiles made of ceramic. And there are some tiles here that are made out of igneous rock, just because it was kind of getting short in ceramic. Had I known better at the time, I would have made these tiles over here out of steel doors, okay? Because steel doors can handle infinite pressure. And then on top of that, you can layer insulated tiles. And why, why do that? Is because what happens is when you're pouring liquid oxygen in here, it's gonna flash to gas, it's gonna boil off. And when it boils off, it's going to kind of create a pressure against the liquid. Liquid can create massive pressure spots that are way above 500 kilos per tile. Anyway, some of those tiles start pushing onto the insulated tiles and it can create breaks, oxygen leaks out, turns to gas, causes a massive mess. I had to maneuver this very carefully. But then I learned later on that, hey, if you put doors here and you also put doors down here made of steel and up here, and then you just simply encase all of that into insulated tiles, then two things happen. First of all, the heat doesn't transfer uh, the same way between insulated tiles and, and, and the gases. It kind of transfers right away. The doors will be cooled, and then they will stay cold. But the insulated tiles will not be cooled because the rate of insulation between insulated tiles and solids is very different than between insulated tiles and gases or in liquids that flash to gases. So you can see here these insulated tiles, they're very cold. And if you just use doors here, they would have been very cold. But then if you put insulated tiles on side, outside, that issue would not occur. The 
external insulated tiles would be fine. Very important thing to keep in mind. And your pressure, you could just feed as much liquid oxygen here as, as you want, whereas currently you can't. So you have to very carefully maneuver this. Anyway, the temperature in here is maintained by this thermosensor. And if it's, um, if it's above negative 90, that these pumps kick in. So if, if the liquid oxygen is starting to get a little too warm, these pumps start pumping it up. Now, this liquid oxygen down here is cooled essentially by itself. And it does that by recirculating from this pump up through the aqua tuner and then down out of the vent. And there's two identical loops, one on each side. If we look at the plumbing here, there we go. We got ceramic insulated pipes, 10 kilos per second of oxygen at negative 189. And the aqua tuners only kick in if this is above negative 195. That's to prevent pipes from bursting from solid oxygen. And then we need to produce this oxygen in the first place. And that's where this machine comes in. This is a liquid oxygen generator. And it begins with uh, first stage over here using ethanol. And this is cooled to negative 96 using this aqua tuner over here. Then the ethanol loops through this loop over here and we have radiant copper pipes, and it cools this atmosphere of hydrogen gas, which is then in turn cooling these thermoregulators, but currently they're not running. When they are running, they are circulating hydrogen gas over here using steel radiant gas pipes at about negative 200 and change, and that cools the oxygen in here until it liquefies. Now, these particular sensors set to above negative 210, because we do not want to cool the hydrogen so much that it will solidify the oxygen over here. That would be bad. And then, to help this whole process along, we also have a counterflow of liquid oxygen from this bottom pump. And it goes up using the copper radiant pipes and then comes out of here. This helps to even out the temperature because the gas comes from the bottom. It's really cold and it cools this oxygen really low. And we want to even out this temperature and then also help to cool the gas that comes from above. And then the, the, so the second pump that's above the, the very bottom pump, this takes the oxygen away into these uh, reservoirs. And then that's where it's removed and then it's pumped into the system. And that's how this was filled in the first place. Now, as for the materials that this thing uses, a lot of it is using igneous rock. That's because at the time ceramic was kind of short. So I only use ceramic where absolutely necessary, just in some critical areas and the pipes, but otherwise used igneous rock as much as possible. And over here, uh, ceramic became a little bit more available. So again, it was pretty widely used here. So if you want to know more about this machine over here, check out the video about the liquid hydrogen using water. As for the amount of energy that this machine produces, well, we got six natural gas generators and a little bit extra. And then the remainder of these is run from another sour gas boiler. But what's more is that we have a steam box here. So these also produce heat in addition to energy. And this heat is then dumped directly into the atmosphere here that's of steam. And the steam is being produced from the polluted water dripping down and then it immediately flashes to steam. A little bit of dirt is left over. Dupes can pick that up. This steam, when it reaches pressure that's high enough, above 20 kilos, is then extracted by the steam turbine. And it adds a little bit extra energy, like 400 watts. So that helps to recover some more power. In addition, we have this power control station. So if you have refined metals, you can feed it into this and get a lot more power out of this using tune-up. So the tune-up can be run on the turbine, but the tune-up can also be run on all these generators. You get a lot more energy out of that. And we also get a little bit of extra energy out of this when the magma recirculates through here after it went from the sour gas boiler. So you get a bit of extra. Now, I did promise to talk about the sulfur, didn't I? So we have sulfur here, and then it's being picked up by this contraption over here, which was added later on. It goes onto this conveyor belt, and it gets taken away, and it goes down and over and over here to this sulfur melter. And I've created a separate video. Check out the link in the description below. But I figured, you know, it's time to put this into survival and see how it works. And what do you know? It works perfectly. And currently it's not running, but it produced all this molten sulfur. And we have it in reservoirs here. And it was then fed into these tiles over here for the uh, upcoming pip farm that will go into production. And I, again, I made a separate video about this as well. But this is an example of it actually happening in survival. And it works. It just so happened I ran out of this visco gel here. So a little bit more is required. 
And then once this is done, then we can introduce the pips and get started. And, you know, we got some pips hanging around over here. Look at them all. So we'll, we'll fetch some from there and then feed into this thing. But anyway, that's an aside. Oh, yeah, one other thing. We have this cool steam vent over here with a kind of an interesting contraption here. Maybe I'll make a separate video about that. Let me know in the comments below. But anyway, this has been Greasy Hammer. And as always, if you like this video, then smash that like button. And also subscribe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.